All right, let's get this show on the road. We're gonna do some more solo GM stuff, and by that we mean also solo player stuff. Um, welcome to Sway. This is our second go at this. It's pretty late, so I'm gonna do this very short and very quickly tonight. Um, I'm a bit behind schedule. So, um, before we jump into things, let's go over the recap of what happened last last time we played. Um, so Sway, uh, for those who didn't watch the video from last time, it is a story uh, pretty much procedurally generated. Like, we don't know what's really going to happen yet. Uh, I am both the player and the GM, kind of me, myself, and die style. We're using some of the same... Uh, tools such as Mythic Game Master Emulator and uh, the Uni uh, for NPC related stuff. Um, we have our PDF filler that we're filling out the form for the Mythic Game Master storyline. And let's let's maybe go through this. Uh, so the adventure notes are an everyday counselor in Seattle, Washington encounters information about the supernatural that you can't possibly ignore. So, in scene one, we had Eric. Um, Eric's out for an evening run through downtown Seattle when he sees a black winged creature swoop down and murder a woman. Picks her up and drops her. There's Eric. Eric will be a reoccurring protagonist. We'll see what happens with him. On to uh, scene two, Eric is taken back to the precinct where he tells Detective Sands the truth of what he saw and he ends up being held um, for it. Basically, it doesn't go very well. Detective Sands does not buy it and he's not very convincing and it sounds like a crazy person and she starts to suspect him for the murder so she holds him, holds him in prison. There's Detective Sands. All right. Um, down the list here, Eric's let out of jail by his lawyer and partner. So there's two people. There's his romantic partner, Cruz Beecher, and his lawyer, who I didn't add. Oops. I'm going to do that right now because I do have him. Lucy Banners. There we go. We'll just add Lucy here. So Lucy Banos. And we're just gonna say real quick. We'll get her picture going so that you can see her as we go. Banos is the um, confident and take charge attorney uh, law. Uh, we'll say lawyer. Lawyer for uh, Eric. Okay, that should now be in place. Let's make sure it works. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Cruz and Lucy were involved in the scene. Um, Eric's let out of jail by his lawyer and partner, uh, but decides to go to a local bar. Like, he wants to blow off some steam. He's not comfortable. This pisses off Cruz, so he ends up going alone. Uh, or not pisses off. Cruz is upset and worried for, for Eric because um, Lucy had mentioned Basically, the lawyer said, hey, Eric, whatever you said to the detectives, like, they think you're crazy. Like, maybe don't do that again. Um, and so that kind of that's, that's, um, leads us into our final little bit of scenes here. Um, so off to the Velvet Elephant he goes. Eric's at the Velvet Elephant when he 
Um, he follows. Uh, he finds um, a familiar face, and he has a memory. There's, there's a very important sort of memory that he encounters while in this bar. It's uh, his old friend Annie, who died tragically prior. Um, there really should be two scenes here, but we didn't really go into the second scene for him. It's more like a closer and finale, but effectively, uh, Eric sees his familiar face, the seductive Yuki, who is uh, the, the girlfriend uh, of um, of Andy when he had his terrible accident and death, no, his terrible suicide, as it was ruled uh, several years ago. She looks almost identical to how she did back then, um, and she seems to be luring someone out with her. Um, Against his better uh, judgment, Eric decides to take a taxi and follow them, uh, where he follows them to um, to a strip club. And at the strip club, the confidential cat is called. Um, he finds his dead friend alive. And that's the cast and what was randomly uh, created for a story last time. I mean, obviously, it's not entirely random. And someone who has a sense of GMing or, or writing would probably grasp this a, a lot quicker than someone who doesn't. So, uh, <coughs> the last time we, we talked, we talked about uh, a particular vagabond-looking guy. So the camera pans back for the next scene to follow the next perspective character. And it's this vagabond looking guy um, in the bar. We're gonna start by looking at his motivation. And because his motivation isn't exactly um, something I wanna play with the NPC emulator, I think we're just gonna go with action and theme for this one. So, command. Ruin. Oh, interesting. That's not what I thought would go. All right. But he has a Vega Bun, so it doesn't doesn't matter. This is still this is still the remnant that I wanted to go with. We're not going to stat him out quite yet. I think we can set him out a little bit later. But I do have a sheet ready for him. Vagabond guy. All right. So Command Ruin. He's looking to destroy some things. I know exactly what this guy is, or was. He's a bit sad, and almost kind of um, repulsed by Yuki as she turns and leaves. He watches idly as Eric exits um, the bar, and Yuki exits the bar. Then he pays up um, and exits as well. And for a second, it's like the audience is like, oh, is he going to follow them? But he doesn't. I think we need to know a little bit more about his exact motivation right now. Um, so we know what what his general motivation is. What is what is he after right now? So we're going to go to the Mythic Jam emulator. to D100. Four and thirty. Fight. 
possession. <coughs> okay. I I think I've got an idea. So he watches this vagabond guy returns back to a small, very small, quaint apartment. As he enters and keys in, you're like, oh, this is where he lives. But then he turns and you see a man lying in a dry pool of bread on the ground. You see a oil can in his, his um, oil canister in his hand. A gas canister in his hand, sorry. And he begins to uh, dump it all over. Then he lights a match. In that classic fashion, he puts a cigarette in his mouth, lights a cigarette, blows a puff of smoke, and throws it into the gas, and, and the uh, apartment starts to blaze. Um, I do have to go to the Mythic GM emulator, and we gotta see what happens, because this could get sidetracked. And the chaos level is gonna go back down to six. Um, actually, it's it's gonna go down to five. No, six. Six is fair. The chaos is ensued, and this guy embodies it to some degree. Um, but it's not Eric's story, it's sort of like a calming moment. Okay. Okay, let's, um... Let's move on to the next point. We're going to roll against the Chaos Factor Fate Chart. Let's see how this goes. Or not Fate Chart. No, we got to roll a d10 against the, the Chaos Factor. That's right. Versus uh, 6. It's higher, so this scene goes off as expected. The man um, burns the body in the apartment in whole. He looks down sad, sort of almost, it's like a mixture of sad eyes and, and complete and utter lack of emotion beyond me, the look in his eyes, he, he glances back up and then, after a long pause, walks out of the apartment in a very nonchalant fashion. This is a very stark contrast from Eric, who was very much your, your mundane sort. I do have to check one thing here. Um, so this character exits is what we call a... I actually don't want to spoil that yet. I think it'll be more interesting for people. Um, I'm gonna do a second research on him real quick. I think with this, uh, hmm. you know, we're gonna we're gonna go back. So he's he's done his burning. I think it's time to consult the um, 
the oracle again to see what this guy is up to. So now he's going to gather innocence. Oh. oh man. Yeah, this is quickly turning into the type of character I thought he was. Uh, I think he deserves a name at this point. Um, Noir name generator. Let's give this guy Noir name. No, he's not a detective. Um, Gothic. No, I'm not thinking that kind of guy. Goth. Let's go with Goth. Caster. Cobweb, just cast. And hello, anyone who's actually a person and watching. So with this um, caster, our new fellow, is going to go about, he, he's looking for innocence. He wants um, someone to, not corrupt, but destroy, as, as we had mentioned, his primary motivation that we rolled originally was... Um, was more in, in the line of destruction. As uh, as he's walking down the street, I think it's like a moonlit night, he sees a um, puddle, and he looks down into the puddle, and he stares almost like uh, at himself in the reflection as if he's looking at a stranger. Something about him just seems very removed and distant. Now we gotta consult the Mythic GM emulator and see if this next scene where he's gathering innocence is going to take a, a turn. So we're rolling against the event focus table. Seventy six is an ambiguous event. Okay, so we're gonna go back and fill this out. So scene seven scene five. Castor is um, Seen at the Velvet Elephant, having watched the, the camera turns. To, the camera turns to Castor. Is seen at the Velvet Elephant. Watching Yuki and Simi. Sad and bothered by it. Um, he returns back to his apartment, to the apartment of a slain victim, setting the place ablaze and walking out.
Okay. It's time for scene six. And I don't think we've rolled against the chaos factor here. Because um, that was a real small scene. Uh, he most certainly should rule against the chaos factor. And I think the chaos factor is going out. That's what I was going to say. Like, that, he's about to go after some innocents. How does that not higher chaos it has to be okay two so even so just need to pull open the flow chart here real quick so Low chart, um, mythic, GM. So we got an even number. It's an interrupt scene. So as he's going to gather innocence, something else is going to happen. Let's see what's going to happen. So we determine the event focus, which we did. Uh, can't remember if sacrifice innocence or destroy innocence. Something like that. I already know what that means for this guy. But let's start with. I think we need to look at the what was it? Gather no it's gathering is this is right. I very much know what that means. Okay, so now we get to roll on this to see that what the interruption is. What is this scene gonna be about? Seven and thirty-two. Violate plans. Okay. I think what this means is that he is going to be pulled away by something else. You know, is this that classic, like, he gets called at, cat called by a prostitute who's looking at him as a potential mark, and maybe rather than gathering innocence, he's going to um, continue his spree of terror on this particular, on this particular, uh, Prostitute, let's, let's see. I'd say that's very likely. It seems appropriate. Now let's go with likely. So likely, still with Chaos 7, is 90. So. Yeah, not quite extreme, yes, but absolutely. So, um, you know, you've got one of those scenarios with, with the, the prostitute standing on the corner and walks by, and it's a shady neighborhood, and she says, you want to have some fun? He looks at her, confused a moment, kind of twists his head to the side, and then he grins. His eyes sort of show excitement a little bit, as if um, this is what he's been waiting for. He says, Absolutely. All right, and I'm not going into that scene 
any further other than maybe maybe we can say we can test um, are they going to hotel, nearby hotel. Like we can we can take it as far as we're not getting into the creepy stuff, but we're taking it as far as we can. Uh, I would say somewhat likely. So now let's go 50-50. 75. Stream, yes. <coughs> I think what this means is not only is it a nearby apartment, it's be or a nearby um, motel. It's immediately like right on that street. She's standing outside of it. He looks up at the name of the, the motel. Um, Let's go with the motel name, Jeremy, I'm sure. I like Moonlight. Moonlight Motel. There's this old sign, and you see them walk in through the lobby. There's an old man at the desk, like bald, heavy set. He's like, Yeah. And he looks at her. And he sighs and slides the key. The key has the number six. And uh, this guy smiles. He's, you see uh, our, our focus character, Caster, here. He's just watching from the shadows as she goes and retrieves the key. And then he follows behind her in a very um, casual way. The door opens, and the two of them are there. And she kind of starts by, let's say it's a chilly night, so she's taken off her coat. And she looks at him and she says, Well, with that, he shuts the door and locks it. She smiles darkly at her, and scene change. Um, I don't think that's going to go particularly well. She's an extra. He's not. Um, we've already established he's not normal. We've already established that he's not afraid of you know, like burning a, a corpse. And there's a lot of assumptions we can make around that. I try not to do too many without rolling them out on screen. But we'll we'll update our log here. You know what I'm going to say? I'm going to do one thing before we close out on this. I just had this idea. I'm going to say it's, it's nigh impossible. Or there's almost... Yeah, nigh, I'm going to go with impossible for this one. Is it possible that she's actually like an undercover prostitute? So you know how they try to catch guys that are, are um, soliciting prostitutes and sometimes they set up a, a female cop. Is she actually a cop undercover as a sustained operation? Alright, so, so it's a D100 verse 7 It's an impossible, right? So, verse 15 
Oh no. And it's exceptional, yes. Okay, we aren't done with the scene. Oh, that got a lot more interesting. Um, uh, a couple more questions. Is she... I'm going to go to the likely with this. Is she at the same precinct as uh, Detective Sands? It won't be Detective Sands. But yes. Well, let's get, let's confirm. So I'd say somewhat likely. Um, somewhat likely is 75. Yes. Uh, and that is uh, an exceptional yes. So this is actually one of Detective Sands' like direct colleagues, maybe even former partner. And so this, this scene continued after he locks the door. She says, I need to see the money first. And he says, you won't need that where you're going. And she looks at his face and I'd say it's almost a sure, I would say sure thing, near sure thing, that she reads it and she starts to panic and calls in the sting operation because there's probably a couple people with her with backup. Ninety-five. So yeah, she looks at him. Her name. We need. We need her name. She's going to now be a character for sure. Um, this one is. Modern name generator. Female. We pick combination Eliana Bookhart Eliana Bookhart I think there's an instinctual thing where he's not necessarily going to want to draw this kind of attention, even though he can probably. Um, is he significantly more powerful than that? I would say near sure thing. Exceptional, yes. <laughs> and then the next thing I would say it's like, uh, somewhat likely that he'll we'll even flip a coin 50 50. Does he want so? But chaos rank seven means it's 75, not 50. But does he want to turn tail and run because we'll draw too much attention? Not because he's afraid, barely. So it's not, it's not an exceptional, yes sort of like he debates it. and I think she pulls out her gun and says freeze now does he have <laughs> does he have supernatural means of getting out of here I think that's a yes we're just going to look up what he is one more time this character what a good enemy <laughs> um, but 
30 to 30. I'll explain what he is a little bit later. So does he have a supernatural means, aka a song, that will help him get out of this mess in a way that will leave them baffled? I would say it's somewhat likely. So it's I don't know if he's 65, but he has factor so high, so high it's going to be 85. He doesn't. That answers the question. If he does not have the means, he cannot be the winged creature. I like that. So then the question is, does he simply use his brute strength bash his way out of here. Is he just going to go right out through the window and run? Again, I would say somewhat likely. Stream? No. Exceptional? No. I think that means he's going right through her. And... Is he going to try and take her hostage? I, I'm going to put this at 50-50. Yes. Okay, so we're going to roll this out with him. Right now she is an extra. We haven't pushed her out to be anything more. But we're going to roll for her. For him. We're not going to give him a modifier. We're just going to roll and see what he gets. So this is caster. There's no way he doesn't have a six and check digit of five. I think he grabs her by the neck quickly. She fires off a gun around. And out they go. By the time the Sting team arrives, because they're probably just around the corner, he moves so quickly that can they can they track him? I think this is a question. I would say, um, I would say no way on case factor seven. So first thing we buy. He's gone. So caster is left. I have an undercover prostitute, but what do we call her? Eliana. You know what? I, sh I should verify that she doesn't get a 1 on 1 on a D666 roll. No, 336. So it's not quite the same. And you know what? really need to turn that into two dice and it'll look nicer for this game. Okay. So, Eliana Broker.
so to update the list caster man is he hit the, the ground running not at all what I originally planned and then Eliana detective Eliana I think that's I think that's good enough actually. I think we're gonna leave that a two part scene and change perspectives again. Um, let's edit the chaos factor. Because we're changing scenes again, we're gonna bring this back down to six. We're changing perspectives. And we're not going to I think well we can test that. Are we going to I need a much bigger adventure note section, <laughs> uh, but I think we're doing that through other means anyways. Caster, what is Caster? Who's Caster? I still don't think we know really what he's up to, but it's interesting because he's, we get to see him more from him. Um, perspective character. Alright, um, if anyone was actually in the room, thanks for watching. If not, um, if you're watching this on YouTube and you liked what you saw, I'm going to keep doing these. Uh, please like and subscribe, and I'll tell me you like this, you like seeing this content, and then I'll keep this up. We'll keep exploring uh, the characters of Sway. Thank you for watching. I'm signing off. Good night.